people, I think, have a misconception about the relation between printed books and e-books. They imagine that the digital and the analog occupy opposite extremes in some kind of technical spectrum. In fact, I think they are complementary and that they will coexist during a transition period when we move into a future which indeed will be digital. What's the time scale for this transition? Nobody knows. <laughs> Everyone is scratching their head at trying to read the future. As an historian, I have enough difficulty re prophesying the past, so I can't make prophecies about the future. Certainly it's digital. Uh, you know, one of the great lessons we have learned from the history of books, which is a burgeoning field of study, is that one medium does not displace another. We've discovered fairly recently that publishing manuscripts, that is manuscript editions, flourished long after Gutenberg. Manuscript publishing increased after the 1450s when he invented or we invented movable type, and it went on for three centuries. So I think people have a kind of false consciousness about how absolute the changes are today. So you do not foresee the death of the printed book? I do not foresee the death of the printed book. I've been invited to so many conferences on the death of the book that I am convinced that the book is very much alive. You know, uh, there's a standard publisher's joke, which it goes as follows. Question, what was the first book? Answer, the Bible. Question, what was the second book? The death of the book. Uh, the book is flourishing. We have more books produced each year than the previous year. Worldwide, there will be one million new titles produced in uh, the year 20, 2011. So the printed book is flourishing, but that doesn't mean that the e-book isn't flourishing. I think they can coexist. I applaud the growth of the e-book as a medium. I think it opens up lots of new possibilities, and people are taking advantage of that. Does the software capabilities of an e-book, because it is software after all, <coughs> uh, change the way that we write books, the way we read them, and the way that we think reality gets stuck together? Well, the way people read is still a mystery. You know, there have been attempts by cognitive scientists to understand how reading processes uh, information through the hemispheres of the brain and so on. I don't think anyone understands the real mystery of reading. We, again, have worked on it historically and we've been able to locate major changes. So, it's reasonable to say that the reading of an e-book is going to be different in some way from the reading of a printed book. What ways? Well, the turning of a page is different. There will be, in a sense, scrolling rather than thumbing through works. Uh, taking annotations will be different. Uh, the overall experience will be different, and I think that uh, people will adjust to it and get pleasure from it. So I don't have a kind of naive, romantic love of old books, although I do love them. I think their tactile qualities, uh, the, the way they feel in the hand, all of this uh, is wonderful and will continue to be enjoyed by a lot of people, but the process of reading itself is certain to undergo a major change and already is changing. To what extent do you think uh, both hyperlinks and the fact that network uh, e-books are networked books, or at least can be networked books, and thus can participate in, a social, in social reading, to what extent do you think that that might change our basic understanding of what it is to read and even to know? Well, I think hyperlinks open up exciting possibilities of creating a new kind of book and a new kind of experience for readers. So in following hyperlinks, you can trail information into deep sources. You can put it together in different ways. You can read, so to speak, vertically by following arguments to their sources, as well as horizontally by uh, tracing a linear narrative. Uh, so the hyperlink quality of e-texts is something that is really transforming scholarship, reading, even 
pleasure because, of course, we already have books that include videos and music. In fact, I've written a book myself that has an electronic component, uh, and music is central to its argument. It's a historical argument. I think it makes it possible, so to speak, to hear the past, not simply to read arguments about the past. So I'm enthusiastic about all of the possibilities opened up by this new kind of hyperlinking. Do you think that those changes will affect the nature of physical libraries? Well, uh, it's hard to say exactly what the effect will be, but there will be an effect. It seems to me that the library as a place for intellectual sociability uh, is becoming more and more important. I mean, libraries never were warehouses of books. They are places where people get together to communicate with one another and to acquire knowledge. We find now when we go into the libraries that students study in groups, often with their uh, laptops and printed books together on the table. There's a lot of running discussion, debate, uh, in a, of a kind that was not thinkable when I was a student. When I was a student, you tried to find the quietest corner of the library you could, and you sat down with your elbows on the table and plowed and threw a book. Well, the experience is now very different, and of course it means that librarians will have new roles. Not entirely new, because they've always been professionals at helping people gain access to relevant information. I see that need of finding the permanent, infor pertinent information is greater than ever. So I think librarians will be really crucial as intermediaries in the process by which people actually gain access to knowledge. All of this means that the library itself will be, I think, a place that will be pulsating with energy and creativity. Uh, it won't be just a quiet study hall. You've been formative um, way out in front on the Digital Public Library of America initiative. Uh, assuming that it goes forward and it, uh, it's as, as important and um, as good as, as we all want it to be, what do you think the ideal relationship would be between a Digital Public Library of America and, say, university libraries? Well, to take the case of Harvard, um, we pride ourselves on having the greatest university library in the world, the greatest by far. Of course, our first responsibility is to the faculty and students of Harvard, and we have to take that very seriously. At the same time, it seems to me that the Harvard Library is a national asset. It's so great. It's been gathering uh, information for so long, since 1638, that it means that those of us in charge of it have a responsibility to the nation and, in fact, to the whole world of learning. So what we are doing already is to digitize our holdings. So far, we've only, with Google's help, digitized books in the public domain, but we anticipate digitizing all 17 million volumes, if we can, respecting copyright, um, and making them available to the rest of the world. As you know, we have uh, initiated a national debate about the nature of a future digital public library of America. It began here at Harvard at a uh, meeting that we called uh, last October. Uh, it's resulted in, I think, a quite a powerful movement to create this sort of thing because it's now possible. And basically, we will uh, form a coalition of foundations to provide the money and a coalition of libraries to provide the books. Now, that sounds simple. In fact, it's very complicated. Uh, and we are now pursuing these complications, dealing with the problems, because we have a secretariat, we've got six working groups, we've got all kinds of experts who have submitted uh, technological pilot projects, uh, and we have a timeline so that we actually think we will get this library up and running by April 2013. And it will perform the sort of most uh, obvious public-facing function of a public library, which is to enable people to read books and other materials for free? 
That's right. It's crucial that it be for free. This is, as I said, a, 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 it's in the national interest. It's, it's shaped by a concept of the public good, public goods as economists understand them. I mean, it's not a naive program without a business plan, but a public good is something in which money is invested for a shared benefit. So it's crucial that this library be free of charge, that access to the materials be free of charge. The materials will be not just books and manuscripts and pamphlets, but all kinds of other material in other formats, such as videos and soundtracks and so on. Um, all of this is complicated, but it is doable. And we feel that with the proper help and the proper financing, we can make it happen. And not just uh, copies of works by Henry Fielding that have been out of, you know, out of copyright for many centuries at this point. That's right. We have a great problem in trying to figure out a way to make accessible books that are out of print but in copyright uh, because we must respect copyright. How to do this is not obvious. So there, uh, there are a whole series of plans. There's something called a collective extended licensing uh, arrangement that has been worked out very nicely in Norway, to a certain extent in the Netherlands, uh, in Japan even. Uh, whether that can be applied to the U.S. is not clear. But there honestly are very promising opportunities to make get this uh, material uh, available for people without at the same time uh, in any way infringing on copyright law. And with, we, we must respect the interests of authors and publishers. We want to have them on our side. So we need uh, serious agreements on a very large scale in order to make this happen. And these are the orphaned works, as they're as they're called. Um, and this was something that the Google Book settlement with the authors and the publishers hoped to provide a way through, but that settlement has been um, set aside for the moment. Um, are you hopeful that, that the DPLA will be able to make uh, progress in this area? Because it's a very, as you say, it's a very difficult area. Uh, we are dealing with an extremely difficult area, and the difficulties are varied. So there is a particular problem of orphan books. As you may know, there has, have been attempts to have orphan book legislation in 2006 and 2008. Uh, they were suspended in part because people said, well, we don't need the legislation. Google is already doing it. Well, the Google book search attempt has collapsed because it's been declared unacceptable by a New York court, and everything suggests that it can't be rewritten in a way that will make it acceptable to the court. And for, for one thing, as, as you, among others, have pointed out, uh, at the table for the settlement about this, this heritage of works were not either readers or librarians. That's right. The settlement was simply a way of dividing the cake, that is the income to be gained by selling access to this gigantic database of digitized books. Uh, that's, that's what the settlement was all about. Well, it, that's not surprising. It was a commercial speculation by a great company. However, libraries are not intended to make money. Our job is to get books to readers free. So the basic principle of the Digital Public Library of America is completely different. And therefore, as it's in the public good, it seems to me we can make a strong argument before Congress, before the citizenry in general, that this is worth doing and that a way should be made clear for us to digitize and make accessible orphan books, that is books whose copyright owners cannot be so far located, and to go beyond that, to, to go into the whole world of 20th century printed and manuscript material, m most of which is not accessible for digitization because of copyright laws. I mean, we have these really rather baroque copyright laws which have kept the bulk of 20th century literature uh, isolated in libraries and unavailable for digitization. Uh, I think we need to do something about it, but we need the cooperation of authors and publishers of all copyright holders to do so. Let me give you the pessimistic 
pessimistic track on this. So, which uh, arguably we as a nation are on, which is to uh, accept um, more and more as if it were obvious that the justification for copyright is not to provide a temporary monopoly, to provide an incentive to creators so that works can enter into the public sphere. But instead, uh, the justification for copyright are, is the moral right, as it's known, of the creator, um, in which it's just simply wrong for somebody to make get any benefit out of this work without the creator getting some something back. In a digital world, we are able to track absolutely every use of the author's material so that even rereading a work that you have already purchased could conceivably under a moral, uh, under the, the moral rights track here, um, even rereading could be something that the reader sh should compensate the author for. So we may be on a path that um, requires tighter and tighter and tighter copyright control of digitized materials. Whereas, I know this is a very long question, but whereas DPLA is proposing ways in which copyrighted material can be made available to be read for free, the mm -hmm. way that libraries traditionally have. Might this current, are you worried that this current path will in fact erode the traditional library's role of providing materials to be read for free? Well, and I'll cut out all that question, <laughs> just take your answer. <laughs> if the current path leads into what could be called the cultural commons and uh, produces uh, a system of dividing it up so that it's privatized, a kind of enclosure movement of the culture which by rights belongs to all of the people, then we're on the wrong path and we must change paths. Uh, now, are we headed irresistibly in that direction? Of course there are pressures that force us uh, toward increased privatization because there are lobbies, vested interests who are behind it. But there is also the interest of the general public, the interest of readers, of libraries, of scattered individuals who simply want to have access to the cultural heritage that is theirs by right. So we have to mobilize this counter interest. And I think we can do so without provoking uh, the Authors Guild or the Association of American Publishers, uh, because Ultimately, it can be in their interest as well. Think of all the authors, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of authors who have written books that are now sitting on shelves, basically unread because they're not available to a large public. Those are books that have been out of print for five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I myself published a book uh, nearly 50 years ago I mean, it's still in print, but it sells two or three copies a year. I would gladly give up uh, the tiny royalties from that in order to have more readers. And I think many authors feel that way. So if these books are made available, no one's economic interest is really being hurt. It's naive, I believe, for authors to think, I can make a fortune from uh, a book of mine that was out of print 10 years ago if only it can be digitized and money can be charged for access to it. No, that book went out of print because the demand for it ceased to exist. But now there's an opportunity to have readers, not a mass public of readers, but readers scattered everywhere who have particular interests that lead them to particular texts. Now that's a gain for the authors as well as for the public. And I think we can find a way to make that gain happen. In addition to providing access to orphaned works, is, in your view, DPLA planning on providing access to the usual and most popular fare in libraries, which are currently in copyright and quite new? Well, I don't know. That's a question that has to be decided. It's not up to me to uh, legislate for the Digital Public Library of America. We have to arrive at a consensus by consulting people all over. The first point that needs to be made is that the DPLA is not for other professors like me. Of course, it should be useful to professors, but it's really intended for ordinary people. And they're scattered all over the country. Uh, they have needs of different kinds. I'm convinced that there are lots of people out there who want to do serious research but have no connection with the university. 
Um, so what do we do about current literature, especially of an entertainment kind, you know, casual novels that people want to read um, while traveling or on a beach? I think that, uh, I'll give you my own opinion. In my opinion, the DPLA should not make available current literature, literature that is not on the marketplace. Why do I think so? I think we want to avoid uh, competition or conflict with the current commercial circuit of books and other materials, including uh, DVDs or movies or videos. Uh, that will simplify things, and I think it will help to enlist publishers and authors on our side instead of coming into a conflict with them. Other people may disagree, uh, but I think another consideration is if we deal with popular novels that are now being sold uh, on the marketplace, then public libraries could feel threatened. Why? Because that's precisely the kind of material that they make available to their patrons. <clears throat> And there's a danger that the people who finance public libraries would say, well, we, we can cut your budget because the DPLA is going to provide everything. That could be a pretext for yet more cuts in a period when libraries are suffering terribly. So I think we are not trying to replace the function of your ordinary small town or city neighborhood public library. We're trying to supplement it. And we can do so by making cultural heritage available en masse in a, on a huge scale. And th that means that the smallest library in the smallest town in rural Alabama or North Dakota will be able to provide to its readers millions and millions of books and other material that simply have been uh, beyond its wildest hopes of providing before. So imagine ahead 10, 15, 20 years, whatever, and the 17 million items in the Harvard collection, the substantial portion of, of them which are either out of copyright or they're orphaned works and we work through those issues, they're digitized. What happens to the physical copies on the stacks? Do the li does the library system find value in preserving them? Does it move them into the uh, off, off campus? Does it do something else with them? What do we do with our physical books? Well, I think that part of Harvard's responsibility to the nation is a responsibility to preserve the physical books. This does not uh, apply to all research libraries all over the country, but it applies to many of them. Um, after all, we know that digital works disintegrate. I mean, that's just too strong a word, perhaps, but the zeros and ones that come together in digital texts can degrade, they can get lost in cyberspace, the metadata can be uh, outdated. There are lots and lots of problems in preserving digital texts, so we must keep the physical copy. Where to keep it? Well, we have a great uh, Harvard depository, which uh, functions extremely well. We get books to readers uh, every within 24 hours. Uh, we, I think, must keep that depository up and running. As I said, the output of books worldwide is increasing, of printed books. So we can't simply ignore that. I think we, we have to advance on two fronts, the analog and the digital, and to do it at the same time. Not easy, because of course, it means a double pressure on our budgets. So we must increase our acquisitions, not decrease them. Now, I'm not pretending to dictate policy for other libraries, and there's an enormous trend for libraries to share repositories or, in fact, to empty their shelves and to depend on outfits like the Hathi Trust to, uh, to fulfill the responsibility of preservation. I'm very keen on Hathi. Harvard has particip is participating in it. But that doesn't mean that we, will, we are absolved of our responsibility to keep physical copies. So books are good and are here for the long run. <laughs> Printed books are 
definitely here for the long run. You know, the Codex, that is a book that you read by turning its pages as opposed to a scroll that you read by unrolling and rolling, the Codex is one of the greatest technical inventions ever made. Uh, we, we know it was made at about the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, but we don't know when or where or by whom. It's still going strong. Uh, the printed version of the Codex since uh, Gutenberg is going even stronger. Um, and I think it really would be naive to, to see this great invention as already extinct when it's flourishing and reaching more readers than it ever had before. So uh, I, I'm an enthusiast about the printed codex, I must say, but that doesn't exclude all kinds of uh, enthusiasm for digital opportunities. And I feel that Harvard, the Harvard Library must take a leadership role in trying to shape the digital future of the country, along with other libraries and so on, but we have that responsibility as well. And so we've created uh, the DASH repository for uh, the articles produced by the faculty at Harvard. We've created an office of, for scholarly communication that is dealing with all sorts of digital projects. We've created a library lab which is encouraging people throughout the university to come up with ideas about how to make improvements in all sorts of aspects of digital communication. Um, we have developed a new alliance with MIT because no library can go it alone today. Uh, and so we will have a kind of foreign policy that will uh, enrich uh, the people at Harvard, along with the uh, constituents of the allied libraries, and we are very active in creating a digital public library of America. So much as I uh, love myself, uh, old books, uh, I collect them, I read them, I love the feel of the paper in my hand, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, I'm not even more committed to the uh, digital projects that are flourishing here at Harvard. Thank you very much.